Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Happy Sunday. Those that are tuning in live, thanks so much for doing that. For those that are sitting and uh, watching this on demand, whatever day that it is, I hope it is a happy one. An opportunity that we have, all of us together, to start our new week together. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We ended up last week talking about this concept called acting as if. Acting as if is maybe the most, I think, one of the most powerful things that we can do. We're going to be learning different words here. For those of you who've been around for a little bit, you know this. For those who are coming for the first time, please stick around. We have our own, we have our own language. Crossover, of course, schema. Acting as if is going to neuroplasticity is, going to be, is, is one of ours that we'll come back to again and again. Thinking, acting, acting, thinking. One of the terms that we're going to be using a lot is acting as if. It's something called be, do, have. Be, do, have, I think we mentioned it here, is to me a very powerful concept in how you change. So just to review from last week, because this week we're going to talk about why we do what we do. So let's sort of like close out last week a little bit now so we can prepare ourselves for the weeks ahead of us. We spoke last week about this concept that it, we're it's stuck in a catch-22. If our brain is a machine that responds to that which it, which it is exposed to, right? think about it, your brain is just responding. You speak English because it's a response to the environment that you're in. If you'd be in a different country, you'd speak a different language because you'd be responding to the language of that country. So that which what, what you see is the response. So if you see certain functionality in your home, you will naturally operate with that level of functionality. If you see dysfunctionality in your schools as you grew up in your neighborhoods and your communities, you're going to respond with a different level of dysfunctionality. Your brain is reacting to the world around it. Now, the good news is that you are, have a soul. You are a soul. Remember, your brain's a computer. You're not your brain. You're your soul. Your soul comes from a piece of God. Your soul comes from a different place. Your soul doesn't come from this world. So your soul can impose itself on the computer called your brain and direct it to where it wants to go. So your soul can say, don't eat that, even though everything you've seen growing up is eat whatever you want. Your soul can say, don't take that, even though everything, everyone around you is taking it. Your soul is saying, don't break that. Don't respond that way even though that feels like what you have been geared towards doing. So the super imposition, if you will, of your life is your soul. Your brain is built to survive. It responds to what's around it. Your soul is destined, comes from greatness. So your soul imposes upon itself on your brain. And now your brain now is adapting to your soul until one day your brain operates under a measure of greatness. That's, in my opinion, called life. It's the process of going from a brain to a soul. That's the game. The little kids, they're just a computer. They have a soul, and they, they're, there are moments where they're all soul, but there are moments where they're all, they're all brain. They're reacting, and they're just doing whatever it takes for themselves. And then over the time, you learn that you have to be a, bigger than that. And you start to impose yourself, your true self, on your brain. But you're always stuck in this catch-22. Because what feels normal to you, is that you or is that your brain? Is it, is it your true self? Or is it just the fact that you're just used to it? It's the neuroplasticity. It's the you always had it this way. And now, when it comes to like big things like right and wrong, it's easy to see. But what about little things? like pushing harder for something, like going above yourself, like being bigger than you wanted to, like starting a new project or starting a new company or um, being an incredible version when the good version was just fine. So now you're stuck because as you get towards that, it doesn't feel like you. So what is you? All the neuroplasticity has been telling you for years that's not what you do, but you sort of sense like you want to do it, but you're stuck because your brain has no experience in how to do it. 
And you go round and round your whole life this way. This is when people feel like a hypocrite. That's one of the greatest reasons why people stop growing, because they feel like a hypocrite. They look around and they go, I don't understand something. Like, this doesn't feel like me. I'm not this person. See, a lot of time when it comes to faith and religion, people start to grow in their faith. Maybe they get a little older and they and their the, the desire to run around slows down and drop. And they start to grow a little bit. Or sometimes it happens when their children become more religious or more into faith. And like they start looking around their kids and they're they're struggling because they're like, that's not what we do. That's the brain going, whoa, you've been exposed for so long to this thing. It doesn't feel comfortable versus the soul saying, keep on trying. Who cares what you did? Who you're going to be and who you were, two totally separate things. So that's the, that's the contrast of how we're living our lives, which is why a lot of people don't grow, because you feel like a hypocrite, because you're supposed to feel like a hypocrite, because it's not supposed to feel like you. Change is not supposed to feel like you because that's what change is. It's upgrading you. It's not supposed to feel like you. It's supposed to feel like somebody else. And you're supposed to climb up to the thing that you want to be that is bigger than you were before. So how do you do it? So we ended last week with this idea of acting as if. You know, in many ways, we have two totally separate pieces of how we operate. Obviously oversimplifying this, but we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. The conscious mind is the analytical mind. It analyzes, it figures things out. It needs to always be congruous, right? It needs to always be smooth. We hate when things don't make sense. It's called cognitive dissonance. We don't like when things don't make sense. We don't like when things are very difficult to analyze, which is why the study shows where um, a company has seen success, let's say, um, in detergents or in tomato sauces. And they're like, this is great. The tomato sauce is working. We have two options. Why don't we add 12 options? And they go and they add 12 options to, the, to their product line. It was once like crunchy and smooth. And now it's with peppers and vegetables and onions and hot and salsa. And then they go and they put it all on the shelves and the, and the sales plummet. They're like, what? When he gave you two choices, you bought it. When he gave you 12, shouldn't you buy more? The answer is no. When he gave me two choices, I didn't have that much to fight in my head, crunchy or creamy. Now when I had onions and this and that, and I get the Texas and Western, my brain's got too many things. It's dissonance. It feels like there's too much going on. And my answer to dissonance is I'm out. That's what people lead difficult conversations for. That's what people watch entertainment because people that make great shows and books and novels and movies understand that if I create tension before you, this good guy gets killed. Now there's dissonance in my, my, my analytical brain. I can't handle that. What happened? How could that be? Let me watch to the end to see how it ends. If I tell you a story and it doesn't, there's tension in the story, you're going to stay to the end, even if you don't care about the characters, because your brain likes things to be smooth. It likes it for it to make sense. That's why so many people don't engage in real issues. They'll rather watch a blurb because the blurb takes a position and says, we're right. It's so much easier to say we're right and you're evil than to understand that there's a nuance here and a nuance there. And you're right. It's just too much. I got too much going on to get into the nuance of what's going on around me. Let me just read a one-liner that is black and white and assume that everybody else is evil. That is, a, that is a brain shortcut because our analytical mind hates conflict. So when you're living in the world of feeling like a hypocrite, you're going oh, to always be in conflict. That's why growth is so hard because you're always fighting. It's never easy. If you're growing, that means who you were yesterday wasn't good enough. So now you got to fight between how you want to do something and how you should do something. And it's always in your head. That's why it's so exhausting to change. That's why so many people change for five minutes and then they go back. 
They don't want to go back. They don't want to eat that thing. They don't want to say that thing. They, they want to be more, but their analytical brain, their conscious mind struggles with it so much. So how do you deal with it? You got to bypass it. Got to go back door. I had a rabbi tell me that once when I was young. I was young and I was idealistic. I hope I'm still idealistic, but I was much more idealistic when I was young. Like I was taking on the entire world. I never forget, I went to a rabbi for advice. He said to me, if you want to take on the world, remember, you got to be the best at finding the back door. I was like, rabbi, what are you talking about? He's like, just look for the back door. And he couldn't have been more right change takes place in the back door the front door is filled with everybody who wants to have whatever they have or they're in charge you go through the back door it's wide open if you want to really change your life if we really want to make a difference in our lives we need to realize that the only really way to make big changes is through the back door i'm talking about our subconscious mind you see our our conscious mind is analytical our subconscious mind could care less. Just feed it and it'll, it'll deliver. It doesn't, it doesn't discern between what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. It's the automatic habits that we have. It doesn't necessarily care why we do what we do. The automaticness of our brains, when you take something and do it enough times so that it becomes neuroplastic and it's tight, it becomes part of your subconscious, if you will. It's automatic. You do it immediately. And when you do something immediately, it's not about why you do it. It's about what am I doing? That's the power of habit. Habit takes something from your conscious mind, and when you do it again and again, it moves it to your subconscious mind, and you, you don't need to be conscious. You don't need to be aware for it to happen automatically. You don't have to be conscious for eating your cereal in the morning. You can do it literally in your sleep. Not literally in your sleep, but basically in your sleep. All you got to do is be up, and you can eat cereal. That's why we don't even use any brain power to get to work in the morning because we can basically do it ourselves. When something becomes a habit, when you do things again and again and again and again, you move it past the, why am I doing this for? Is this really good? Should I take this way? Should I take that way? Should I do this? Should I take this exit, that exit? You just do it and your brain doesn't even turn on for it. This happens sometimes for those that, are, that pray every day. You start praying, next thing you know, you're done. You're like, how did I get here? Your brain's been doing the same thing for so many years. It clicks on, it goes the way it's not supposed to be that way. But this happens when your subconscious brain, what it's your brain brain, I'm just using these terms con sort of conceptually, when your brain does something enough times, it doesn't even like question why. So if you want to change your life and you're not the person you want to be, and your analytical mind's like, but that's not you, but that's not me, but that's not me, I can't do that, but that's not me, you're never going to get there. So here's what you do. You act as if. Just act like you are. But I'm not. Okay. I'm going to act like I am. But I'm not a great dad. But I'm not a great husband. But I'm not very brave. I'm not a brave person. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a strong person. Okay. I got it. Thanks for labeling yourself but who knows what the future holds now you got to be strong if you're not a strong person act strong but it doesn't feel like me what is you it doesn't feel like your soul your soul's strong it doesn't feel like your brain your brain's a computer that's just reacting to what you had until now maybe until now you didn't have to be strong Maybe until now, you didn't have to push yourself because you had someone else to rely on or because you had a lot of green lights in life. Maybe until now, you were young and life was pretty simple. As hard as it is when you're growing up, when you're in your first 20 years of your life, you're basically in a very, for most people, you're in a very structured system. And maybe you're getting older and life's more dynamic and the world's much more complex than it was when you were in your, when you were in your younger years. Who cares who you are? who you want to be 
And who you want to be is more important than anything else because if you want to be something, then act like it. Because if you act like it, even though you don't feel like it, what's happening is you're giving your brain neuroplasticity that it didn't have before. And over time, when you act like something enough times, you bypass the conscious, it's not me, it's not me, I'm a hypocrite. And you go right back to the, oh, this feels like me because I've been doing this for the past week. It doesn't feel like me to work out every day. It doesn't feel like me to say the right things. It doesn't feel like me to pray. It doesn't feel like me to study longer. It doesn't feel like me to start something else. It doesn't feel like me to say that thing on the phone. But you know what happens if you say it a couple times? It starts feeling like you. You know why? Because your brain has this neuroplastic. Instead of feeding it what you're not, you feed it what you want to be. And you start to all of a sudden be like that. That's how people grow. Sometimes it, life thrusts itself on people. And they're struggling. They're, they're sent a challenge. And they step up. And all of a sudden, they're, per, they're a person that they weren't were when they were younger. Sometimes they wake up in the morning, well, I don't want to be this way anymore. And they force themselves to be something that they weren't until one day they wake up and they go, wait, this feels more like me. This is how you do it. This is how we change. This is a concept called be, do, have. We live a life of do, have, be. What's do, have, be? Do, have, be is do something so you can have something so you can be something. When you live in a very structured world and people want to define people, if you can do it easily, they'll define you by what you do. This world has a very hard time defining things that they can't measure. So what do we do to survive in a world where you can't measure the most important things in life? So you find things that you can measure and measure that. So we judge things by what they do. What do people do? If you want to be a good student, do work, have good grades, be a good student. Do, have, be. When you live in the world of do, have, be, you live in a place where you're doing things to have things to be something. Do work, have money, be rich. Do good deeds, have reward, be it righteous. But what if that was just a, a crux? What if that weren't really true? Whether we buy it, ask somebody, when you meet someone the first time, you ask them the name. What's, what's the first question you ask the name? After the name, what's your name? Oh, what do you do? And that's it. Oh, what do you do? Oh. Where'd you go to school? Oh. Where'd you go to school? Oh. Any more questions after that? Why do we need to ask any more questions? If I know what you do, I know who you are. I buy, do, have, be. I know what you do, so now I know, or what you have. If I get one of those two answers, I know who you are. What if that weren't the case? What if this world, this bottom line physical world, is not really what drives it? What if there's something deeper called me, called you, called our souls? What if it wasn't like that? What if it wasn't do, have, be? What if it was be, do, have? You determine who you want to be. And then once you determine who you want to be, with real determination, your soul changes. That's why something like Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur works. You can stand before God, be filled with sins, make a determination that you want to change, and in God's eyes, you're different. How you didn't do anything. You're just standing all day and praying. The answer is actual change on a spiritual level doesn't take place in your actions. Actual change takes place in your intentions. But they have to be real. They're not preferences. I'm changing my be. And if I do it with real resolve, I'll look up and go, what do those people do? What do great people do? What do strong people do? What do kind people do? What do generous people do? I don't care how old I am. I don't care how young I am. What do they do? Because I've already changed my be. Now I gotta just figure out what to do next. But my do's are being driven by my be, not the other way around. I don't gotta do something for 30 years for someone to pat me on the back and go, you've made it. You've made it when you determine you've made it. And once you have a real be, you can look around and go, what do those people do? And then you do those things and you'll probably have what they have. It's not do have be. It's be do have. We'll pick this up and close. I hope to close this out tomorrow. And we'll go to the workbook because it's in the workbook as well. And then we'll move on. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in.
Have an awesome, awesome day. With God's help, I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow.